right again a good morning to, to all of you. We have just uh, completed our series on the Epistle of James, and uh, this morning I would like to begin a new series. And the name of this series is called uh, What Every Christian Ought to Know. What Every Christian Ought to Know. There are things that every Christian, I believe, must know. I think it is said if we meet uh, Christians that are ignorant of some of the most basic truth of the Bible. And so this morning we are going to begin with the first, right? The first of uh, in this series. And that is what is a Christian, right? What is a Christian? Now turn with me in your Bible to the book of Acts. We're going to consider this subject or this question from the book of Acts in chapter 2. And we're going to look beginning in verse 37. Right? Beginning in verse 37 uh, through verse 42. So let me just read our text. So Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sin. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourself from this corporate generation. So those who received his word were baptized. And they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. Now let us pray. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you again for gathering us this morning. Uh, not just to meet with one another, for we come together to worship the one and the true God. Help us to realize that it is not merely our duty to come and worship you, but it is indeed our delight. And grant to us the joy, the joy of coming before the triune God, the creator of all things. And we also pray as we come together this morning, Grant to us not only the joy and delight of coming before you, but the hunger and the thirst after your truth. And so we pray for your blessing as we study this passage of scripture. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Or as I say, uh, our subject this morning is what is a Christian. If you are a Christian, you ought to know the answer right, to that question. What is a Christian. Now, we are sometimes told that the Philippines is a Christian country. And I was just wondering why. Why is the Philippines a Christian country? And people might answer and say, because the majority of the people who live there are Christians. So Singapore is not a Christian country majority of the people who live there are not. Really? Majority of the people in the Philippines are Christians? How do you know? Why do you say that? How do you know that they are Christians? So that is what we are talking about. Maybe some of you think this morning that you are a Christian. And I want you to think about this. Why do you consider yourself a Christian? Perhaps I think most of us here 
consider ourselves a Christian. As I say, we need to think about why. Maybe some of you think, think, oh, I'm a Christian because my name is James. I've got a biblical name. And so I'm a Christian. Well, another may say, I'm more Christian than you because I'm Jeremy James. All right? <laughs> so I'm both the Old and the New Testament Christian. All right? You see, there are a lot of misconceptions about what a Christian is. All right? And so it is important for us to clarify that. And so let us now come to look and consider the Bible and see what the Bible says as to what a Christian is. I'm sure when you read your Bible, you should be able to detect that. If not, so consider with me. You see, we are going to look at this passage in Acts, right? And we are going to consider this group of people who became Christians. And we want to ask the question, what marked them out? What distinguished them from other people who are not Christians? Surely there must be a difference, right? Otherwise, why should we consider ourselves Christians? If you are not any different from your neighbor or from your colleagues in your office or from your friends in your campuses, if you are not any different, then what is a Christian? Why do you consider yourself a Christian? So what marked you out? And that is what we see here. What marked them out as Christian, as a group of people who were different from the other people around them in their time, right? So we are going to do that. We are going to see what marked them out as Christians. And I submit to you that there are at least three things that ought to be true of every Christian. And we see those marks in these people, right? In these people in this passage, all right? There are at least three things that may be said of every true Christian. And I want you, as you listen this morning, if you consider yourself a Christian, to see if you have these marks. Otherwise, tell me, why do you still consider yourself a Christian? Mark number one, all right, we're going to see. Now, the first mark of a true Christian, the first thing that may be said of a true Christian is that a Christian, a biblical Christian, a true, genuine Christian, is someone who has a deep conviction. So the first thing true of a Christian is conviction. Is convictions. And so we read in verse 37, Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, and we are told here, now when they heard this, when they heard this, they were what? Now you see, you read in your Bible, right? It says that when they heard this, they were what? Now, I think in most of your Bible, if you're using an ESV, it is written there or translated there that they were cut to the heart. Now that is an important phrase for us to ponder on. What happened to these people when they heard certain things? You see, there are people who hear, there are people who hear day in, day out, maybe week in, week out. They come to the church and they hear. They hear the gospel. They hear the preaching of the word. They hear, but nothing happened. You see, no truth of these people. You see, these were the first group of believers, the Christians, as they were. They formed the Christian church. They became Christian. Why? What is so unique, so special about this group of people? It is because these people were cut to the heart by what they heard. They were cut to the heart. The question then is, what does it mean to be cut to the heart? We are using the NRSB. It is translated as being pierced. It is a strong word. There is something dramatic as it will. There is something powerful that happened to these people. It kind of knocked them off as it will. They were cut to the heart. They were pierced deep within. What does it mean to be pierced in your, in your heart or be cut to the heart? It means that you're convicted. It means that you see something that, 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 
that strikes you as evil. Say something, you hear something that kind of disturbs you. You are never disturbed by anything you have heard from the scripture. Never disturbed at all. Then why do you consider yourself a Christian? Then you are not a Christian like the Christians in the Bible. Because you were never disturbed by what you hear. We have been coming to this church maybe for some time already. Some of you for many years. At any point, at any point on any Sunday, when you hear the word of God, then you will cut to the heart. There's something pierced deep inside. Something disturbs you as if you're shaken. You're shaken. You see, you are, if you are shaken, if you are being pierced to the heart or cut to the heart, you see, you will have no rest. You have no peace. Because you will be thinking about that something. It's a terrible thing. There are so many people that come to the church and they hear the preaching of the word of God and they go out of this building and they don't ponder upon what they hear because it means nothing much to them. You see, what you heard don't mean a lot to you because it didn't strike. It didn't strike. It didn't cut deep into your heart. You see, that is the meaning here in verse 37. That is what Luke is trying to tell us about the first Christians. They were Christians because they were disturbed by what they heard. And so to be a Christian, this is the point, that there must be this deep conviction about something that you have heard. It cannot be hear, hearing from this year and the other year go out. You're not a Christian. You may hear a hundred times. You may hear the preaching of the word of God a thousand times or a million times. If it never hurt you, if it never said anything to you, if it never disturbs you, you are not yet a Christian in the biblical sense. You may be considered a Christian by your friends. You may be considered a Christian by your neighbors because they pass by your house, they see a cross on the gate. Oh, that's a Christian home. Really? That is how you tell whether a person is a Christian or not or whether that household, whether it is a Christian or not. You see, we have a very superficial way of, of identifying a Christian. If today in our midst, now we have some Amolang, right? some white men from UK right? or from US, immediately we think that man must be a Christian. Why is he a Christian? He's a white man. You see how superficial, how wrong we are. How defective in our thinking about what is a Christian. If you are a Christian, you ought to know. Right? You ought to know about what really is a Christian. Not all the things that you heard about. Not the way other people identify a Christian. We must identify a Christian the biblical way. He must have conviction. No? He must have conviction. And so conviction is the first thing. Then you might ask, right? Here is Disturbed by what? He's now, you know, this, this conviction in him is convinced, he's persuaded. But persuaded about what? Have you ever asked yourself if you are being disturbed right, by the hearing of the scripture, what is it about the preaching of the scripture disturbs you? What are you being persuaded? Just consider these people. We were asked, he said, we know, we are told in verse 37 that they were disturbed. They were pierced. They were cut to the heart. And then we want to know. We want Luke to tell us. They were persuaded by what? What is it that they disturbed them? I believe that there are at least three things we can see in Luke's record about these people. Three things that disturb them. Or three things that they are being persuaded about. By what they have heard. By what they have heard. Number one. In fact, I want to ask you, if you call yourself a Christian, if there was something that, that, that you were persuaded about that made you a Christian. I'm sure along the way, huh, when you became a Christian, you decided, so called you decided to become a Christian. Along the way, there, there must be something that you heard that you were persuaded about that made you want to be a Christian. Have you ever asked yourself what were those things? You see, for many people, this is what they were persuaded about. They heard that if you become a Christian, you'll be wealthy. Oh, 
I'm persuaded. If you are truly persuaded, all right, or you'll be healthy, you'll be successful, you score straight A in your exam, you're fully persuaded by them. Sure, I want to become a Christian because surely I want to be wealthy, and surely I want to be healthy, and surely I want to be successful. If I'm being persuaded by becoming a Christian, I can be those things, then I will be a Christian. Is that why you become a Christian? Why did these people become Christians? Number one, you see, they were convinced of the truth about Jesus Christ. That's the first thing. They were persuaded by what they heard about Jesus Christ. You see, Peter was, the pre was preaching to this group of people in this chapter in Acts 2. And Peter was preaching to them about a man that they heard so much about. These are a group of people who are not ignorant of this man, Jesus, whom Peter was preaching about. You see, a lot of you have heard Jesus before. You have heard the name. And so Peter was talking about this man. They heard so much about. They heard, they have heard his teaching. These Jews people, Jewish people. They have heard the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of them saw Jesus on earth. They have seen his miracles. And then they witnessed his amazing death. And then the news of his resurrection. They heard all these things. The person and the life of Jesus Christ. His death on the cross and his resurrection. Maybe most people that you know of. Well, at least many of them had heard the same thing. They have heard, perhaps even, the testimony of many people who witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Jesus rose again, maybe many of them didn't see him. But there are so many hundreds of people who have seen the risen Christ. And maybe they have spoken to these people. But they never believed in this man. They never believed in this man. Peter tells them, said, this man, right? This man, in verse 22, men of Israel, hear this word, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourself know. You have witnessed, you have heard, you have seen this person, and God has attested God has shown to you and proven to you that this is indeed the Son of God, the Savior of the world. This is someone whom you should bow to, someone you should follow, not someone you should reject. But Peter is speaking to these people, this man you have heard, you have seen, you have witnessed, but you reject him. You reject him in your life and you crucify him. Verse 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified, killed by the hands of lawless men. You see, I'm not sure whether at any point in your life that you have been convicted of this truth about you. That all through your life, from the day you were born, you have been rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, oh no, I believe in him. You really? What is belief? What does it mean to be a Christian? It is to follow him. It is to do what he tells you to do. In fact, Luke records in his gospel in Luke chapter 6, in verse 46, the words of Jesus to the disciples. And this is what Jesus said to them. And why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do what I say? Why? You are not a true disciple. You, are, you don't really believe. There are many people who call Jesus Lord. They call themselves Christian, but they do not do what Jesus says. You say, where did Jesus? He's here. It's in the Bible in your hand. You don't care to know. And you don't care to obey. Therefore, you don't care to do what Jesus tells you to do. You don't care to tell you to do what Jesus tells you about how you should live your life. You don't care about the priorities that Jesus is teaching you. Do you know what priorities you should have in your life? 
What did Jesus say in the Bible? Do not lay up treasures on earth, but lay up treasures in heaven. That is priority. When Jesus commanded Mary and told Martha, 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 you are too busy and distracted by the busyness of this life. But Mary have chosen the good part. That is priority. That is to know what is important. The good part that Mary has chosen is to be with Jesus, is to hear his word, not like Martha. Now that is what it means for, to follow Jesus Christ. Not to live life your way. Not to pursue your own priorities. Or to think what is important according to the ways of the world. To imbibe worldly values. Set your minds on things above and not on things on the earth. How many times the Bible has been stressing that? How many times? Just read your Bible. You see this being, you see this coming across again and again. Because the Bible is concerned about how we lead our life. But you are not. You don't care. You live as you like. You have your own priorities that is not in accord with the teaching of the Bible. Then you are not a follower of Jesus Christ. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do what I say? These people, these people that Peter was preaching to, they were like this. Until this point, when they heard this, when they heard, as Peter tells them, this man whom God has attested, you crucify, you reject, you don't follow, you don't care, you live your life your way. They were hearing. They were hearing and listening to the Apostle Peter preaching. And then something happened. Something struck. Something cuts through. You see, there are many hearts. They are so hard. It doesn't cut through. You can hear day in, day out, week in, week out, but it just doesn't cut through. It cannot get you. You cannot understand. You're so dull. But then come a point. But then come a point with these people. It cuts through. And then they came to the realization that all this while, yes, we are the unbelievers. Yes, we may be the Jewish people, the, called the people of God. We may be people who come from Christian homes. We grew up in the church. We have Christian names. We might even be baptized. But then I come to this realization, but despite of all those externalities, those outward expressions of my professions, but deep inside, I am still not a Christian because I've never been, con been persuaded. This, not, this, has, this truth has never cut through to my heart and make me disturbed. Then now, you see, they are disturbed. They realize that they have been mocking Christ at Calvary. They have been laughing at Him. They have been ridiculing Him. They have rejected Him. They crucified Him. But now, they're convinced. They were cut to the heart. And they had this realization. Yes! Yes! All these years, I've been living such a life. I've been ignoring God. I've been rejecting Christ. I don't care about His Word. I don't care about following Jesus Christ. All these years, I'm a rebel. I live a life as a rebel. And now I come to see. Now I come to see what have you come to see? What have they come to see? Verse 36, where Peter says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made Jesus, right, Him, both Lord and Christ, that is Messiah. This Jesus whom you crucify, this Jesus whom you have, reject, have been rejecting all your life, this Jesus is indeed God Himself. He is the Saviour. He's the promised Messiah. Can you not see? Then it cuts. And then something dawns in. And then something makes them realize, Oh, this person, which I've been ignoring all my life, he is God. He's the Savior. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus. So they come to see, they become convinced of the truth about who Jesus really is. That is conviction. That is what got through finally. They come to see Jesus. 
as he truly is, the Son of God and the Savior. The Savior has come to save me from my sin. So the first thing about their conviction is that they were convinced or persuaded of the truth about Jesus Christ. But it's the second thing we see about their conviction here. There's something cut through. A realization about who Jesus is. But that is also a realization, deeply persuaded, convinced of the truth about themselves. The truth about themselves. Then they look at Jesus and then they look at themselves. What did they see? They saw what Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6 when he saw the throne of God. When you see God in all His glory, when you see Jesus, when you see who He really is, it is not like what many people think. He's, he's just a good man. He's just a great prophet. He's just a man like any other man. He's just a founder of another religion. No. He's more than those things. Much, much more. Have you come to that realization? And then when they see that, they are like the prophet Isaiah and they say, Whoa! If that is who Jesus is, then I'm undone. Why? Because all these years, I have not been living in obedience to this God who created me. How can that be? What kind of person am I? What do I deserve? And so they saw the truth about themselves, that they are living in rebellion against God. That they were the people who put Jesus to death. That's what we see in verses 23 and 24. Peter says, you. Sometimes people ask this question, who really put Jesus to death? The answer? What's the answer to that question? Who really put Jesus to death? The Jewish people? Yes. The Romans? Yes. You? Me? Yes. Because he was there because of our sin. Because of our sin. That's why he needed to be there. That's why God put him there. Finally speaking, it is God who put him there. So in order to save us. And so these people saw the truth about themselves. We are cruel people. We are wicked people. We are sinners. We are the reason why Jesus is on the cross. Why he is there crucified. Why he needed to die that cruel, shameful death. We are the reason. And so they saw the truth about themselves. And they said, we are sinners. And then they saw the third thing that they were persuaded about. Persuaded about the truth. Of the truth about Jesus. And of the truth about themselves as wicked Rebels. Third thing. They are also persuaded of the danger they were in. Now, we see that they were in fear. And that's why in verse 37 it says, When they heard this, when they heard what Peter was preaching, when they heard the gospel, when they heard the word of God about Jesus Christ, they were cut to the heart. And then what? They cry out. They cry out. Verse 37. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? That is, a, you see, the tone here is a sense of panic. They were being terrified. It's like the Philippine jailer when they realized, when he realized the danger he and his families was in, he cried out to Paul and said, what must I do to be saved? What must I do? Now you see, that is what it means to be cut to the heart. That they, you are terrified. They are now, they realize that they are now in danger of the judgment of God. That if they do not do anything, about their condition now. They are doomed. You know how many times the Bible warns us of this? And do you not realize that Jesus spoke more about hell than heaven in the Bible? Why? Because He wants us to get this. 
He wants to impress upon us the great danger every one of us, men and women, boys and girls, every one of us, we are in great danger. Are you not terrified? No. You are not a Christian. Right? From the Bible. You are not a Christian. You have never been disturbed. You have never had this feeling of being terrified. The need to run somewhere for shelter. The need to cry out. Have you ever cried out? What must I do? You will not be able to sleep tonight if you have been convicted until you found the answer to that question. What must you do to be saved? You will not. If you can sleep in peace, you're not a Christian. You're not disturbed. These people were disturbed. That is the first thing that marked them out. When you read this about them, the first Christians, the early Christians, people could see that these people, this group of people, they were different from all the rest. From all the rest. These people in the world, they are not terrified. They are not disturbed. They can go on in their life. They can just go on. Life is good for them. And they just go on living their life. Unaware of the great danger that they are in. But they are different. Are you? The second thing that marked them out is that it is conversion. Conversion. Verse 38. Now look at verse 38. They say, Peter said to them, when they asked, what shall, I, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sin. Repent and be baptized. This is conversion. So what? The next, the second thing, right? The next thing we see, the next mark. The next thing they mark them out is that of repentance. That is what conversion is about. That's what conversion is about. Some of you maybe you have been converted to Christianity. And a lot of people think of conversion as changing religion. Oh, last time I was a Buddhist, I was a Hindu, but now I decided to become a, to be a Christian. So I've, I'm now converted to Christianity. Now that is not conversion that the Bible speaks about. That's not what happened to these people that they were cut to the heart and decided that, oh, now we move from one religion to another. So what is the conversion? What is conversion? Conversion is to repent. In other words, what we see here is this. What Luke tells us is it. The second mark of a true Christian, a biblical Christian, is that they must be converted. You see, conviction alone will not save you. Well, some people here, you know, maybe they are moved up to a point. Oh, okay. mm, maybe shed a few tears. And after that, ha, 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 ha no, go back to their old life. That is not what Luke is describing here. The thing that Luke is describing here is that these people repent, repented. These people repented right? because that's what Peter tell, told them to do. Repent, right? Repent. In other words, what, Jesus, what Peter is telling them that if they were truly convicted, if they were really truly disturbed by this thing, then what they needed to do was to change. You cannot remain the same. You must change. You must change your way because you are a new person. That's how the Bible describes a Christian, that he is a new creature in Christ. The old things have passed away and the new has come. So old life, the old ways must go and the new way and the new life must come. Is that that change in your life? Or are you still the same old person? The only thing changed about you is that you change your name. Or previously you don't come to church, now you start coming to church. That's the only thing the only change that happened in your life, or those are the kind of changes? See, Peter says that you must never, not, must never, you know, you're never the same again. You see, to change, to repent is to change your ways, to change your lifestyle, and to turn from your sin. And then Peter kind of described it right here, uh, further in his preaching. And Peter, in a sense, was trying to clarify what he meant. You see, when we tell people to repent and to change their ways, 
No, I think it's important to clarify what that means. And here Peter clarifies, he says, repent, be baptized, right? Every one of you. And then he says in verse 39, for the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Verse 40, and with many other words, I mean, he continued, right? He continued to preach to them, continued to explain to them. With many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourself from this crooked generation. Or in the other translation, be safe from this perverse generation. Now, that is what it means to be a Christian. That you are no longer continuing Continuing with this perverse generation, this crooked generation, you are no longer like the people of the world. That is what it means to be a Christian. You must turn. That's what repent means. You must turn away from that. You must not continue to live like this crooked generation, this perverse generation. What does it mean to be perverse? What does it mean to be crooked? Paul tells us, and let me read a few verses from his letters to the Roman, and he describes, he, he describes here the perversion of humanity, of the perversion, the crookedness of our society. In Romans 1 and verse 26, for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passion for their woman exchanged natural relation for those who are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relation with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their errors. And God called these acts shameless, crooked, perverse, not gay pride, not pride. You see, we live in a perverse generation. Shameless thing, we honor them. Wicked things, we promote them. What kind of world are we living in? And Peter is saying to the people before him, say, you must not be like these people, the people of the world. That is what it means to be a Christian. You are now a new person because you have turned. But you have turned. Turned from sin to God. You no longer are like those in the days of Noah. They laugh when the prophet warned them. Or those in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, they continue to live a godless life when Lord warned them of the coming judgment. They couldn't care less. They were not bothered by those things. Be saved. From those things, or in the words of Paul to the Corinthians and Second Corinthians, say, and come up from among them and be separate. That is what it means to be a Christian. In other words, there is no reason to believe you are a Christian unless your life is changed. Right? There is no reason to believe that you are a Christian unless your life has changed. Thirdly, there is conviction and there must be conversion. And these are so true of this group of people in Acts 2. These mark them out as a group of people that were different. And thirdly, continuation. Continuation. Verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now the word devoted is in a tense that denotes continuation. And so the other translation say, and they continue in a KJV, right? And they continue steadfastly. So it is in what we call an imperfect tense. Or in the other translation, I think it's translated as they continually devoted themselves. So the idea of devoted here is a continual action. 
They continually devoted themselves. That is the, the sense. Right? They continually devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and the prayer. The point to see here is that what marked them out as genuine biblical Christian is that their Christian life didn't end with baptism. See, there are a lot of people that profess to be a Christian, they want to get baptized and other baptized. No more. That, that is all to the Christian life. And then everywhere they go, I'm a Christian. Why are you a Christian? Be baptized. Got certificate. My name there. You know, Grace Reformed Church. Or even the Reformed Church. All right. Or maybe go, go, go paper, right? Golden paper. And never continue. That is the end of the story. That is not what a biblical Christian is. Because we are told that they continually devoted themselves or they con continual steadfastness, right? Continually devoted themselves. You see, in the book of Acts, right, as we study this book, faith for each believer was the beginning, not an end. Faith for them to become a Christian is a journey. There was a beginning and then it continued. When Luke tells us they continually devoted, he is speaking of the mark of these people. You see this group of people? Look at them. How you look at their lives. Look at what they are doing now. They were different. And then they continually do something or committed themselves to something. Then we want to ask, what was it that they were continually devoted to? Look at your Christian friends. What are the things that they are now if they call themselves Christians, what are the things that they are now continually devoted to? I think that is a searching question. Because the answer for many is that these people who now call themselves Christians, they are continually devoted to what my non-Christian friends are continually devoted to. Mm, can't tell the difference. But not so with these people. We are told, notice the things that now they held dearly to. Notice the thing mentioned by Luke that they were continually devoted to. One, we are told that they continue to be devoted, or they steadfastly, right? they were devoted to the apostles' teaching or doctrine. Is that true of you if you are a Christian? Are you devoted? Are you committed to the apostles' teaching? As inscripturated in the Bible that you have in your hands. How much is this worth to you? How important is the Bible to you? I think for many people, the cookbook is more important than the Bible. The recipe book. But that's what a Christian is. That's why they are now no longer the same. That's what unique, special, different about that group of people. Is that what is unique, special of this group of people? Of us here, get it? That we are, we can be described as people who steadfastly devote ourselves or continually devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. Because they now realize that this is the word of God. This is special. This book is unique. And because now they love God, now they want to obey Him, the only way you can obey Him is to know the word of God. Because if you're ignorant of, of the word, there is no way you can obey God. If you're really interested to follow Jesus Christ, really interested to be obedient, to live a life of obedience, then you will really be interested in the book. Secondly, they were also continually devoted to the fellowship of the saints. 
You see, now there is this new love for the church. This new love for the brethren. Now they see themselves as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are no longer strangers. They see that relationship. They see that oneness. We are family. And so there is this desire to be with them and the desire to edify one another. Why? Because we care. There's this concern about people who wander away, as James tells us. If you are not concerned when you see your brother or sister wandering away, then you have no love for these people, no concern. Then you only demonstrate that you have no real relationship with these people. If you have no real concern to build up the faith of one another, to edify, then you have no real concern for these people. Then you don't have a relationship with these people. But these people were different. They now see that they are all one in Christ. And so there is one oneness. There is love for one another. The desire to make one another because they the desire to build one another up in their spiritual lives. And then they were also continually devoted to the breaking of bread. Continually devoted to the breaking of bread. That is a demonstration of the commitment to be united with the church. The commitment to be united with the church. All your talk about being a Christian, as far as the Bible is concerned, is rubbish. You have no desire to be part of his church. Right? You can live your life outside the, the circle of the church you know, and you, are, you stay content. You stay content. It's like a child, you know, no, nothing to do with the family. You, know. you stay content. What kind of child are you? It's inconsistency to call yourself a Christian if you've got no desire to be part of the church of Jesus Christ. Fourthly, and prayer. And they were continually devoted to prayer. You see, when you read Acts, one thing that cannot escape your attention is their devotion to prayer. It, it starts even in the very first chapter, in verse 14. And it reads, All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the men and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. You see, they were devoting themselves to prayer. Then we see here they were devoted to prayer in chapter 2. What do you read in chapter 3? Peter and John were going to the house of prayer, right, to the temple to pray. What do you read in chapter 5, uh, chapter 4? Well, this is what we read, verse 24. And when they heard it, they lifted their voice together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who make the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, what were they doing? They were praying. What do you read in chapter 6? Right, we read in chapter 6 and verse 4, but we will devote ourselves to prayer. Devote to prayer. They were devoting themselves to prayer. They were praying. They were praying. Chapter after chapter, you see the true people of God. They are people of prayer. How is it that the prayer meeting is the least well-attended meeting in the church? Sometimes church leaders speak with some kind of pride. Oh, they say, you know, prayer meeting, you know, people don't like prayer meeting because in most churches, less than 10% or just about 10% attend prayer meetings. And that tells you what? That tells you what? If you read the Bible, that tells you a lot about these people. And that tells you a lot about these people if you are not committed to these things. The teaching of the apostles, the fellowship of the saints, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So what is a Christian? What is a Christian? You must have deep conviction about the truth of the scripture. You must change. Not just hearing alone or just being touched alone will not do. You must change and conform your life to the teaching of the Bible. And then you must continue. We must continue in the things of God. Let us pray. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you again for your word to make things so clear to us. 
we know that a lot of harm. We are ignorant due to the fact that we are not people of your word. We pray as we go through this series that you may clarify this issue and help us to grasp them. And this morning we pray that it help us to realize what a true, genuine, biblical Christian is. And that all of us in this hall might indeed be deeply convicted and change and live a life of continual devotion to you. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.